lot of people when um, when you join, um, sometimes your default settings will automatically unmute you. So please keep yourself muted unless you are presenting um, or you have a question and you're called upon. Um, so with that, um, welcome everyone um, to today's educational webinar on um, the nursing um, the nursing workforce study that was required under House Bill 4003. Um, before we start today's presentation, I just wanna have share a couple housekeeping items. The educational webinar is for informational purposes only, so no health policy board business will be conducted. And members are welcome, but not required to attend, to attend as well as staff and guests. And anyone who's not able to join us live or wants to go back and watch any part of today's educational webinar, a recording will be made available on the Oregon Health Policy Board's website that will usually post the following day. Um, again, please mute yourself um, while we're during, um, during the educational webinar. But um, if you have any questions, we will take questions from members as well as guests towards the end of today's educational webinar. However, if you have a question that's technical in nature or clarifying, uh, please raise your hand or send me a chat so we can pause the presenters um, to take your question. Um, and I believe that's everything I had to get through. So I think we are legally in the clear now. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our presenters today. Um, with their bio. So our first um, presenter is Joanne Spetz, um, who's the director and Brenda and Jeffrey L. King Presidential Chair in Healthcare Finance at the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies, University of California, San Francisco. I IHPS is a 50-year-old research unit that conducts innovative research to support, guide, and enable policymakers, communities, and cl clinicians in making evidence-informed decisions that improve health and health care for individuals and families. Dr. Spetz's research focuses on the economics of the healthcare workforce, organization of healthcare services, and quality of health care. She directs the federally funded UCSF Healthcare Workforce Research Center on long-term care, which generates evidence to ensure an adequate workforce to provide patient-centered care to individuals, with long-term care needs across the lifespan. She is an internationally known expert on the nursing workforce, leading studies of nurse supply, demand, education, earnings, and contributions to the quality of healthcare across healthcare settings. Her current research includes a federally funded study of the roles of nurse practitioners and other advanced practice clinicians in expanding access to medication treatment for opioid use disorder. Very impressive, Dr. Spetz, and welcome. Um, I'm going to also read Jana uh, Bin, um, who is our co-presenter today. Jana is the executive director of the Oregon Center for Nursing. She began work at OCN in 2009 and also has served as a program manager, program director, development director. She is the past president of the National Forum of State Nursing Workforce Centers, a nonprofit connection and technical assistance to nursing workforce centers nationwide. A native of the Portland area, Jana has a bachelor's degree in journalism from California State University, Northridge, and a master of public administration from Portland State University. Jana has a background in nursing workforce issues, healthcare workforce development, nonprofit management, and local government. Welcome, Jana. We are delighted to have you both. And with that, um, Madeline, please go ahead and pull up today's slides. I'll also drop the link to the slides on the website in the chat for everyone. Uh, but go ahead, Dr. Spetz, when you are ready. Great. Well, thank you for having us. Um, Jana and I have worked really closely together for several months on this report and with a lot of support from the Oregon Health Authority, as well as people on our team. Um, Emily Shen, Timothy Bates, and Rick Algier. And um, we are really grateful for all of their contributions to this. So next slide.
Okay, got it. I see what happened. Um, so can you click one more time, please? Thank you. The animation did not quite work on this. Um, so I, I'm just going to run through the conclusions of what we found in our research. Um, I will preface by saying that in this study, we looked at data um, from the Oregon Center for Nursing and various other Oregon administrative data sources. We looked at some federal data sources. Um, we interviewed healthcare leaders, nurses, and other people from across Oregon. And we also examined the literature associated with what's happening with the nursing workforce, um, most of which was nationally focused. There's not a lot of studies that end up focusing just on Oregon, except for really what Oregon Center for Nursing publishes. So here is what we have found. Um, First, no surprise, I think, to most people, the nursing workforce in Oregon is very severely stressed. And the pandemic really revealed and exacerbated problems that existed already. So many of the things that we're going to describe are not new. Um, and most other states have similar challenges. So, um, so these are things that are not unique to Oregon in most cases. Um, there are widespread nursing shortages, there are high rates of burnout, which was a concern before the pandemic, and nurses and employers are both deeply concerned about the situation. The causes of these shortages differ across regions and also um, vary across the healthcare settings, and we don't have a lot of data available to assess the true depth and extent of the shortages. We're very reliant upon um, anecdotal reports because there is just a lack of systematic data that would enable us to say that it's worse in Bend versus Portland or it's worse in nursing homes versus hospitals. The data that we would need to assess that just don't exist. Um, next slide. And you can click. Thank you. Um, nursing workload was pointed to by many of the people we interviewed as a concern and also perhaps a contributor to the shortages that we're observing. And this is a concern among both nurses and employers. There was a sense that Oregon's nurse staffing law is not fully achieving its goals of ensuring adequate staffing for having high quality patient care. And there were differences in opinion about why this may be true. There were some concerns raised about the complexity of the survey process. Um, there were some perceptions that enforcement was not as rigorous as, as desired or intended or as ideal. Um, and there also has not been an objective evaluation of the outcomes of the law or the outcomes of the revisions to the law that happened a few years ago. The data do indicate that nurse staffing in Oregon's hospitals are above the national average, but what we don't know is whether that's good enough. Um, there may be differences in the acuity of Oregon's patient population in hospitals or in the nature of the services that are happening in hospitals that may mean that staffing should be better. Um, or and or it could also mean that staffing is like woefully ridiculously inadequate in other states. So even though Oregon is doing better than other states, everybody is doing terribly. Next slide, please. We did see overall that um, we looked at some education data and we found that the growth in new enrollments in RN programs has slowed over the past three years. Um, and this is a concern. Um, we also saw that LPN enrollments have also declined. Next click. Um, education programs are struggling with growth and largely due to difficulty in recruiting faculty and in finding clinical placements for students. The faculty shortages were largely attributed to low salaries for nursing faculty as compared with clinical salaries. We heard in some regions of the state that a um, master's educated nurse working in a clinical setting earns 40% more than a faculty person. And so even though there are, there are different attributes to the job and different reasons that people pursue different occupations, a 40% differential is pretty hard to overcome. There also were shortages of clinical placements that were attributed to a number of factors um, those included the shortages aforementioned. Um, when you have a shortage of incumbent experienced nurses, 
it's very hard to bring on new um, students for clinical placements because your workforce is already stressed and shorthanded. And so adding students to the mix who need to be supervised and mentored can um, really feel unsustainable when you're already feeling short staffed. Next, uh, next click. Um, we also saw that applications to RN education programs in Oregon have declined over the past four years. This is actually unusual. Applications to RN education have been growing nationally, although at a slower rate than they did before the pandemic. It's not known why applications declined in Oregon. Um, one thing that I will note about this is that the data are numbers of applications and not the numbers of unique applicants. So there may be people applying to multiple position or multiple you know, programs and maybe pre pandemic people were applying to four programs and now people are applying to only three. So we would see that as a decrease in applications, but not necessarily a decrease in applicants. We just don't know whether there are truly decreases in the number of applicants, but the growth in the new enrollments um, shrinking or slowing is problematic when you combine it with shrinking numbers of applications. And one more click. Um, overall, we, we see in the data that Oregon's nursing workforce is very reliant on nurses educated in other states. There are more nurses coming to Oregon who were educated and originally licensed in other states than educated in Oregon. And that um, may be fine. Um, you know, a lot of people like to move to Oregon for a variety of reasons. But if interstate migration slows into Oregon, then that may have a really detrimental effect on the adequacy of the nursing workforce in Oregon. So that is something to pay attention to and is a reason to support growth of Oregon's nursing education capacity to help make sure that there are enough um, graduates in Oregon prepared to take on jobs as nurses retire. Next slide. We also found that Oregon's nursing workforce is not as diverse as the state populations, but the current nursing student population more closely resembles the racial and ethnic diversity of the state. So this is actually very good news. There has been tremendous progress rate made towards increasing diversity. Of course, there is always more progress that could be made, but it was really nice to see that that, that racial ethnic diversity is um, pretty close among the student body. Um, I will note that gender diversity is nowhere near close. Um, and, you know, so so nursing continues to be, you know, 85% female and um, or more. And of course, that doesn't match the population distribution of, of men, women and um, transgender individuals. Next um, click, please. The nursing assistant and the LPN workforces are somewhat more diverse than the total population in Oregon. This is what we also see nationally in general, because these are occupations that require less post-secondary education. Um, you tend to see more people of color in these roles, but these are also the roles that pay the least. And um, in the case of nursing assistants, um, in some communities around Oregon and nationally, those jobs may not even really pay a fully living wage. Um, and may be short on benefits and other resources. So when we've seen national studies, we find that nursing assistants are often reliant on social services. We did not have data to make a comparison for Oregon, but we do need to be attentive to the higher concentration of people of color in these jobs. Next click. The RN and the nurse practitioner workforces about which we had adequate data to look at, um, those are less diverse than Oregon's population. So as I said, as you move up into um, education that requires a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, you see the diversity trickling away. And that means that there's a lot more that we can do to support the pipeline of education. Click. Um, nursing students overall have become more diverse over time. So it's not just the overall licensed nurse workforce, but also specifically registered nurses. And one more click. Um, this diversity also has been increasing for LPN students over time. Um, next slide. Um, so the mental health and well, so the, now we're getting into our recommendations based on those, that really quick overview of the conclusions. Um, so uh, these are grouped into different categories. So our recommendations really began with workforce retention. And that is because as we went through interviews um, with nurses and healthcare leaders across Oregon, 
um, it was really clear that there is a leaky bucket. And we have a lot of nurses in Oregon who appear to be leaving the workforce. Um, we could do a lot of, we could make a lot of recommendations about increasing the numbers of graduates and growing entry into nursing, but we need to plug the holes in the leaky bucket. That means retaining the nurses that already exist. Um, that, to do that, we had a number of recommendations. First, the mental health and well being of nurses must be prioritized and supported. And employers are doing a lot to, to deal with this. They recognize this challenge and they need to maintain and redouble their efforts. Um, we point in the report to a number of resources and strategies for this. Click. Um, employers must create healthy work environment interventions to support overall health and well being. This includes professional autonomy, ensuring adequate staffing and resources to support nurses in their work and ensuring that there are good re, uh, working relationships with physicians and management. Um, and of course, there are many employers that are doing this. I mean, we're, we don't mean to imply that employers are not trying to do this, um, but this really needs to be job number one across Oregon and really nationally. Um, click. There are a number of things that government can do to support these employer efforts. The um, Oregon Wellness Program, um, we recommend be maintained and expanded. Um, there could be incentives created or seed funding or grants that would support workplace health programs. And also the state could help compile guides and resources in order to guide employers in these efforts. And these would be employers across all settings, long-term care, home health, community-based services, public health, hospitals, et cetera. Next slide. In the area of the education pipeline, we also had um, actually quite a number of recommendations. Um, the, the education pipeline really begins with K through 12 education and the overall diversity and adequacy of the nursing workforce is dependent on what's happening in K through 12. So there is a need to make sure that those K through 12 resources are adequate for students from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds to be prepared to enter a scientifically rigorous field, such as nursing. Um, mentorship for, for aspiring health professionals has been shown to be an important component of that support. Um, shadowing opportunities to learn more about careers in healthcare. It was way outside the scope of our study to assess Oregon's K through 12 education system in general, but anything that is done to improve K through 12 education in general is going to help support diversity in the nursing profession. Click. Um, high schools and post-secondary education institutions can do a lot more to help students get into nursing education and be successful. Um, this includes, um, let's do two more clicks just to get all the, all the things up there. Thank you. Um, this would include creating standardized prerequisites, providing more guidance for students into prerequisites, developing diversity pathway programs that could be supported by state funding, um, and leveraging the Oregon Consortium of Nursing Education Framework to try to standardize prerequisites, um, make it easier for students to find and pursue their pathway into nursing, whether that is nursing assistance all the way through being a graduate, educated, prepared, advanced practice nurse. Next slide. Um, we also made recommendations around nursing capacity. Um, we recommended that um, RN education capacity be particularly focused on in rural areas. That is where we heard the most concerns about the availability of new graduate nurses. And there are a lot of strategies that could be undertaken to really develop and expand programs that exist already out of Oregon's nursing programs and expand them into rural opportunities um, and semi remote RN education programs. And, the, and some of that is happening already, but I think that could happen even more, especially if there was some support funding from the state to help programs expand even further. Um, there are more opportunities to share faculty between associate degree nursing and LPN programs within community colleges to allow RN students to take the LPN licensure exam so they could begin working as LPNs while they're on the way to their RN degree. Um, offering more part time and evening and weekend programs to allow working individuals to pursue RN education while they're employed. 
Um, increasing support services to students, especially first generation to college and people who are from backgrounds that are underrepresented in healthcare. Um, those kinds of support services, which um, there's a huge literature on this, can really make a big difference in maintaining and growing the nursing workforce. And um, pay for faculty needs to be increased. And there are a lot of different strategies that can be undertaken for this, because there is a tension that we recognize, and we discuss this in the report, between um, the desire for pay equity within educational institutions um, with the notion that an English professor has in many ways the same job as a nursing professor, but there is a tension between that desire for that pay equity and the reality that the nursing professor can earn 40% more working as a clinician. So in other states and other um, institutions, we have seen supplemental salary strategies and policies such as tax breaks, loan repayments, um, private funding to supplement nursing salaries or to create clinical partnerships. Um, so there are a number of strategies that could be pursued to help fill that gap. And um, that may make a big difference in recruiting nurses into faculty roles. Next slide, please. Um, we also recognize that the clinical experiences of nursing students and early stage nurses are very important. Um, collaborative groups should create centralized clinical placement systems outside the Portland area. Right now in the Portland area, there is a centralized um, collaborative effort to um, help with clinical placements, to reduce competition for slots, identify opportunities to place more students that maybe would have been overlooked without a collaborative effort. And those kinds of local collaboration should exist outside Portland. Um, simulation laboratory facilities need expansion and um, educators need more training to optimize their use. And when we talk about simulation education, we're not talking just about like really cool mannequins, although those are really cool. But there are a lot of educational strategies that can be undertaken that involve simulation, ranging from computer simulation to actors who served as standardized patients. Um, and there are more education and training about how to leverage these as an adjunct to hands on clinical experiences would be really beneficial to the nursing workforce. There also can be more done to expand apprenticeships, internships, residencies, um, and there are um, efforts that Oregon government agencies and employers both can engage in to expand these types of programs. Uh, two more clicks. Um, there is now a nurse intern licensure um, that was established in HB 4003, and those regulations should be evaluated and innovation should be encouraged to optimize their use as that um, in nurse intern designation moves along. Um, education programs also should establish elective courses and specialties as partnerships between employers and educational institutions. We've had a number of um, different case studies that we've seen from around the country where, for example, a hospital will realize that they are going to have three of their expert perinatal nurses retire within the next year or two and then go to a local education program and say, hey, we will provide the clinical space and maybe even some funding support if you can create an elective for your students who want to to choose to take this extra class in perinatal nursing. That's a way to create a pathway of people who have a little more experience when they enter the hospital to be able to hit the ground running into a specialty type of role. Next slide, please. Um, we had some recommendations that were in two categories on this slide, certified nursing assistants and then the nurse licensure compact. With respect to certified nursing assistants, um, we heard a fair amount of confusion and, can, and just concern about how to optimize the CNA1 versus CNA2 categories. There was a sense among many of the people we interviewed that these two categories have created confusion. Um, I, it's our understanding and most people's understanding that these were intended to help create a career ladder, but it does not seem that it has been fully successful in that realm. And there's an opportunity for OSBN to examine that and think about how to simplify that pathway if the two categories are even needed. Um, and OSBN is in the process right now of assessing the length of training required for CNA certification, which is longer than the federal standard. Um, maybe that longer length is warranted, 
Um, but there, it's a good opportunity for them to continue that process of making that assessment and determine what the right length maybe should be and there should engage in ample stakeholder input in that process. Regarding the nurse licensure compact, we heard a lot of interest in um, Oregon joining the national nurse licensure compact which enables nurses who are licensed in other states to work in Oregon without formally applying for a license in Oregon. As long as they maintain their residence in another compact state, they can work in Oregon. But if they move to Oregon, then they need to apply for a license in Oregon. Um, this could be beneficial, but we need to be realistic about what problems the nurse licensure compact solves and what problems it doesn't solve. The main problems it solves is making it easier for traveling nurses to come to Oregon and all and um, when they do come to Oregon they're working under Oregon's regulations, even though they're through a compact license. Um, it also can facilitate telehealth because a nurse working in another compact state does not need to get an Oregon license to work with Oregon patients. What it does not do is magically create a whole bunch of permanent residents to Oregon so it facilitates the telehealth and the temps. But it does not, you know, create a new workforce that ne didn't necessarily exist before. Um, what does happen with the compact is that nurses working in Oregon under the compact, because they don't need to get an Oregon license, you don't really know how many of them there are, and you don't have them complete the standard surveys that other Oregon licensed nurses do. So you do lose information about your workforce. Um, and Oregon State Board of Nursing also does not get the revenue from the license applications, but managing a compact licensure process is more expensive. It's actually more administratively expensive to have kind of that single state versus compact state licensure process internally. So if Oregon chooses to join the compact, there needs to be an exploration about how to compensate for that loss of data and how to compensate about the loss of funds to OSBN. Next slide, please. Um, we had some recommendations around Oregon's nurse staffing recognition uh, regulations, which I alluded to previously. Um, you know, as we noted in the conclusions, there were um, a number of people that we talked with that felt like the law was not fully meeting its goal of ensuring adequate nurse staffing to ensure adequate quality of care. Um, we recommend that the law be objectively evaluated on its impact on nurse staffing, workload, patient safety, and nurse satisfaction in Oregon. That type of rigorous and external objective evaluation has not been done. Um, and any revisions to the law really should be aiming to increase its clarity, support effective partnerships between nurse staff and their management teams, and reduce unnecessary burden um, from a regulatory perspective. Enforcement needs to be consistent. We also noted that the law says that the nurse staffing plans that are developed are supposed to account for acuity. Some states have established more structured acuity requirements, um, such as having a formal acuity assessment system that is used to determine staffing. That could be explored and should be explored. And um, there is one other state, my own California, that has fixed minimum staffing requirements and that also can be explored, um, but it should that exploration should be done with a realistic understanding of the literature, which does not um, really create an open and shut case in in favor of um, fixed minimum nurse to patient ratios. There are some things that have been beneficial about them and some things that have possibly been detrimental and that should be assessed realistically um, in in order for Oregon to determine a pathway forward um, if it wants to pursue fixed minimums. Next slide, please. Um, we're getting close to the end of our slide deck. So we had some, uh, we, we really strongly recommend that there be attentiveness to the variation across different regions of California and that policymakers and employers should support market research to understand what those local barriers are, um, which is really necessary to improve recruitment and retention. Um, in rural communities, two areas that we heard were particularly important was recognizing that economic opportunities for partners and spouses of nurses are one of the factors that draw nurses into a rural region or may help retain them in a rural community. 
and the overall infrastructure and quality of K through 12 education, internet resources, and other attributes in the rural community are important for retention. If for both rural and ur urban communities, we heard issues about um, we, we heard issues about the um, need to explore reducing the cost and increasing the supply of housing in Oregon. And so, um, you know, now it wasn't just a rural issue, that's urban, rural, and I, I think that or Oregon is well aware of these issues for, for people living within the state. Um, next slide, please. Um, finally, we recommend that there be enhancements to data collection and analysis to help anticipate future shortages. Um, efforts to regularly collect data on employer vacancies and perceptions of the local labor market would be valuable. There are a few different strategies in the report that we recommend. Um, you can do um, kind of regular surveys of healthcare employers about their vacancies. And your neighbors up north in Washington have this really cool program called the Sentinel Network that has um, been a really neat way for them to assess emerging shortages across all health occupations. So we'd recommend that you take a look at some of those different strategies to have more data about future shortages and emerging shortages. Um, data systems that currently exist don't do a great job of supporting more detailed or um, kind of detailed or rigorous projections of future nurse supply and demand. Right now, OSBN is doing some revisions to its underlying databases that will help solve some of those problems. And there is a need to just ensure that the data systems will support that kind of projection work that, um, that could be done for Oregon. There also is a need to invest in identifying and understanding the root causes of racial disparities in Oregon's nursing workforce. Um, examining the um, successful strategies that have been undertaken and can be undertaken to expand opportunities for marginalized populations is really essential and involving workers in those communities in identifying root causes and creating the solutions is, is essential. That is the end of our slide deck, so I think we are now ready to take questions. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Spetz. We appreciate it. And um, Jana, I just wanted to also, um, before we start taking questions, was there um, anything that else that you wanted to add or speak to? No, actually, this okay. the, the presentation was mostly to hear from Dr. Spetz about the recommendations, but um, I do want to be here to answer any questions that are really specific to Oregon. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so today, um, since we do have um, about 20 minutes for questions. Um, I first wanna open it up to uh, the Oregon Health Policy Board members that um, are here this morning with us live. And then also um, I wanna welcome others who are participating in this morning's educational webinar. Uh, you're also welcome to ask questions um, or share your comments as well. And so if people um, you know, can raise their hand, that helps us coordinate the order. and um, if you prefer to have your question uh, read out loud, you can send a chat to myself or Madeline Guthrie, um, today's host. So with that, um, we'll give everyone a moment. Um, I see um, Oregon Health Policy Board member, John Santa has his hand up. Go ahead, John. Yeah, thanks. That, that was very informative. I'm sorry I don't have a, a video this morning. I'm just wondering if you have any comments or, or, or are there suggestions for what clinicians, especially physicians, um, can do to help here? Um, I know that I've always considered nurses to be the ultimate um, uh, team uh, players. And uh, um, unfortunately, <clears throat> I know from my career that uh, sometimes physicians aren't. Um, and um, uh, 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 did you all explore anything, any recommendations about um, how physicians um, uh, should, or what role they should be playing here to help out? It's a great question. And I agree with your observation 100%. I mean, healthcare is a team sport. 
And, um, and when we made recommendations around healthy work environments, that includes focusing on the relationships between physicians and nurses. Um, you know, I think employment settings can do a lot to help facilitate that, ranging from, um, you know, kind of recognizing, applauding, um, and kind of celebrating the good players, the good relationships, the good examples of those partnerships, and also, quite frankly, probably being more heavy handed on the bad players and the bad participants um, there. We heard from a number of people that there were internal concerns in organizations about bullying behaviors and not just physician to nurse, but also nurse to nurse. Um, and that workplace cultures that tolerate bullying, harassment um, and these kinds of negative interactions are really facilitating the problem of the leaky bucket of nurses. So um, the, the overall workplace culture is, is really central to this. And I think physicians, especially when they're in leadership roles, um, both set the tone and can do a lot to influence the overall culture and behavior. Um, just because it's always been that way doesn't mean it always needs to be that way. Jana, do you have anything to add? Mostly what I was going to say. I mean, there's nothing that uh, of all of the work and all of we didn't specifically as part of this project look at what physicians could do or what, you know, different professionals can do. But again, the overall culture and what the workplace environment is means a lot both to um, both for the mental health of the, the workers that are working there and ultimately just the patients and the entire system. So yeah, it's I think that for physicians and for any professional in healthcare to recognize that it is the team sport and everybody is responsible for even if there's any leadership that physicians could do to encourage a healthy work environment, um, that would be extremely important in Oregon. Great, thank you. And thanks for the question, uh, John. I see um, another board member, Melina Moran, you have your hand up, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. And um, thank you for that report. That was um, really wonderful and thorough. Um, I have been an RN for many years and now a nurse practitioner. Um, so I can speak from personal experience about nurse burnout, patient ratios, patient nurse ratios, um, and the mental health of the nursing workforce. Um, I was wondering, um, because you briefly spoke on nurse burnout, that you did not um, have a root cause of that. Um, anecdotally, I think this has a, you know, a high cause due to the nurse patient ratio. Um, in your full summary, did you go into any more information about the nurse burnout? Um, yes, we did. The, the report goes into that quite a bit more. And there were a number of different factors we heard, which probably vary in importance depending on the employer. Um, you know, the aforementioned issues about just overall culture um, culture of respect, bullying, harassment, lack of resources, lack of support staff, all of those things contribute, as well as the direct nurse to patient ratios in many settings also can be a factor. So, um, you know, there, there's probably not a single solution. And, um, you know, for, for lack of a better way to put it, you know, I, I, I never underestimate the ability of a well-intentioned policy to be undermined by a poor employer. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, an employer that does not prioritize creating a culture in which nurses are successful and supported and sustained, um, you know, there, there's a limit to what regulations can do to solve that. Now, regulations might help, that, that is something that could be explored. But there, but that's not the only solution that is necessary. Um, you know, any culture that is that is not respectful of nurses and the contributions they bring to the table is going to have these kinds of burnout problems. Jana, what do you have? To I have a lot. So one of the things that in Oregon that we did as part of this study and also as part of um, a body of work that we've been pursuing is we surveyed the. Um, the, all of the license, all of the nurses who help who hold an Oregon license, 
And that's about 80,000 people. That doesn't mean that all of them are working here, but there's about 80,000 people who hold an Oregon license. We surveyed them and we got about 5,000 responses back. The, and you are absolutely right. The number one thing that they said was the top work stress was their increase, a really heavy or an increased workload. But that wasn't the only thing. Number two was the was an uncertainty for when things are going to settle down and also just being so burnt out. And the burnout, you know, kind of back to what Dr. Spetz was saying, the burnout is because of a heavy workload, but it's also because of the um, about workplace violence, about people coming in psychologically, psychological violence as well as physical violence, and just having to deal with the the numbers of people that are coming in that have a, a lot less tolerance for um, for unpleasantness that they might have prior to the pandemic. Um, so in the report, it really goes into some detail about specifically the, the state, the emotional and mental state of Oregon's nurses, which isn't great and kind of and goes back to the, the overall conclusion of employers need to take responsibility for retaining their nurses. It needs to not be just a responsibility of the nurse to um, build up their own tolerance for a toxic workplace. It really is the responsibility of an employer to change the workplace so that nurses and other healthcare providers can go back to a workplace that isn't going to traumatize them on a daily basis. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I could agree with that. I think also um, to follow that with, you know, during the pandemic, the patients kept coming <laughs> and you can't turn them away. Um, and so I think, you know, looking not only at that nurse patient ratio and trying to enforce the Oregon nurse staffing law, but also, like you said in your report, um, how important it is to get more nurses. And um, if we have more nurses, then we need more places to put the nurses. Exactly. I mean, one of the big one of the biggest problems that we have right now is not just like the nurse staffing law is very, very specific to nurses that are working in hospitals and acute care, which makes sense. That's 55 percent of the number of the nurses that are working in our state. But the other 45 percent who are working in community based settings, skilled nursing, long term care, if they don't have the nurses that they need, that's going to increase the workload of the nurses in acute care. And that's something that we have, we are hearing and seeing and getting a lot of information about right now. That if you have you have you have patients that are that are too sick to go home, but not sick enough to stay in the hospital, and yet they're stuck in the hospital because there aren't staff at the facilities where they could be sending them to. It's such a holistic problem. I mean, it's it's I, I use this I use this metaphor a lot. The Venn diagram circles are kind of closing in on each other. And so it's a holistic problem that needs multiple solutions that are that are tried. That there is not going to be one silver bullet here, which is also why the our pages of recommendations is like we've got 10 pages of slides and a huge report about the recommendations that we can provide because there's a it, it's a multi-pronged approach that we need in Oregon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, um, yeah, thanks for those questions, Melina, as well as um, Jana and Joanne. Um, I want to take a moment to see, I don't see any virtual hands up or live hands. Um, I don't see anything in the chat. Um, one thing that was uh, occurring to me is uh, we were uh, discussing um, nurses, uh, the emotional state of nurses in Oregon. Um, is there anything either of you could share? Um, how how is um, the emotional state of nurses in Oregon? Um, do we know how that compares to nurses in other states or um, throughout the country? Is there anything there to share, or am I if I'm out of scope? I, we can put it on the table that question. I don't know that there have been any systematic surveys um, nationally yet. But um, we've been doing surveys in California, and I can tell you that you are not in a uniquely terrible situation. <laughs> it's pretty bad down here, too. Um, and I've had some contacts with folks in um, the Boston area, in um, Missouri, 
and um, I'm trying to think what other places I've heard from lately, North Carolina, and, you know, everybody is struggling with very similar problems. Um, you know, e even even in California, where our nurse staffing regulations are more um, more strict than in Oregon in many respects, the issues about shortages and burnout and stress and, you know, how do we and, and this is where where Jana's comment about the holistic nature of the problem really comes true. Um, we've seen nationally we're, we're seeing more and more data that tells us that there have been precipitous retirements of nurses. So a lot of the exit is more experienced nurses um, for whatever reason, and they may be exiting just hospitals and going to other settings. But it looks like a lot of them are just fully saying i'm going to retire early you know i'm, I'm done and. Um, so that means that employers across all settings have a whole bunch of open positions that they were used to have filled with experts. And so now they're trying to onboard new graduates to get them into, you know, get them to be experts as fast as possible, but they've got kind of a limited group of people to mentor them. So now add to that the desire to grow nursing education. And the nurses who are incumbent are just like, wait, I'm so busy trying to onboard these new graduates. How on earth can I increase my clinical rotations on top of that? And employers are attentive to that, right? They know that that's a, a problem. And so you're really seeing a bottleneck in all of this. So, you know, it's gonna take a lot of creativity to think about first retaining the nurses that you have. And then are there things that employers can do to more creatively develop and support people in faculty roles who maybe really are dedicated to those clinical rotations. Um, you know, there, but, but you can't you can't just say, oh, we're going to increase numbers of graduates if you don't solve the clinical rotation problem. And you can't really solve that problem unless you start solving the staffing problems, which you really can't solve if you can't retain your nurses, which is why we started the recommendations with that retention issue. I was also going to say the American Nurses Association has been conducting mental health and wellness surveys. They've actually done three rounds of them, and I'm going to put the, the latest round in the chat. Um, if you want to go out there, because you can break it down by state, and you could be like, hey, we're doing a lot better than Nevada. You can look that up if you really want to. The, a lot of the questions that are on there um, are very similar to the ones that we specifically asked in the state of Oregon. We wanted to get a a solid response rate and also ask some other questions that are kind of more specific to the work that we want to pursue. So if you want to, um, I, I'm going to put this in the chat right now, if you want to just see what other states are doing and their experience, um, you can see that in the chat. The work that I've been doing with the National Forum of State Nursing Workforce Centers, which is basically us but other states, um, this is a topic that comes up every single time that we connect. Um, there are things that, uh, what's really interesting to me is that in a lot of other states, they haven't been able to um, allocate any kind of state level support for nurses. So for example, in the, in the report, we talk a lot about the Oregon uh, Wellness Program. And that was something that was, uh, more additional funding was given to that program so that it could pri prioritize mental health counseling for nurses that were in distress. Um, that's actually getting started up right now. And in other states, there are no other states that I know of where the state actually put together a fund for registered nurses, not nurse practitioners, not physicians, but registered nurses. And in Oregon, we also do CNAs and LPNs. If they are experiencing a mental health crisis, then we're supporting them. Um, so good on us. We're doing it. It's still pretty ugly out there. So there's more that we could do. Great. I think. Thanks for that additional information. Um, I see one more hand up from John, but before we go to, the, to John, I'm just gonna tee up. Um, I don't know if Mark or Neelam, um, we're, we're nearing the end of the educational webinar. So I might just be putting a little um, blurb in your mind, like maybe you could wrap us up in a, after John with kind of like next steps on the report going to the Oregon legislature and you know, kind of what we're hoping to see in terms of um, any um, kind of adoptions or next steps with these recommendations and this work here in Oregon. But before that, um, John, I see your hand is up. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, thanks for allowing another question. I'm, 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 I'm listening here 
any comments on on the role of families you know when i sit and listen to you all and think how difficult it must have been on nurses that families were excluded um, and i can only imagine how that might make some patients really difficult to manage and and i think on my career how it was not unusual when folks were hospitalized in some cases for us to urge we'd like a family member here all the time you know, we, we would appreciate your, your help in, in keeping your family member calm and oriented, uh, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and even on the outpatient side, you know, we've had some controversies uh, now that um, because of the shortage of help, some families were um, uh, paid um, um, to step in as nurses and, and did terrific jobs, terrific jobs. And now with the crisis over, potentially that's going to go away. And so any, any aspects related to families and how some of those policies might be rethought in, in the circumstances in the future. And I mean, Joanne, do you want to take that first and then I can follow up? You know, I think I think your well-being survey data speaks to it. So the, this one, this yeah. one's yours. <laughs> so I think you're kind of taking it from two different places, John. I think when you're looking at it from both, like what's the support of nurses that what did they get from their families, and also how difficult was it when families were excluded from patient care, um, and the the latter we didn't necessarily look at as part of this survey. That was an issue that was so um, front and center at the beginning of the pandemic, but it just really is just more one more one more nick in the chain or, you know, I don't know what metaphor I should be using here, but it was just one more thing that was adding to the overall stress and um, and uh, uh, difficulty that nurses experienced during that time, because not only were they dealing with um, family members who were impatient and frustrated and, and scared about their loved ones, but they were also, there were things that family members do when they are visiting with someone in the hospital. And there is an element of, of observation that family members can do, which does help lighten the load of for, for workers, for nurses. So, yeah, that was just kind of one more thing that they added on to that. When we did in our well-being survey, we asked people, we asked our nurses, where did they get the majority of their emotional support? And many of them, I think more than 70% of them said that they got it from family. Um, but they all said that they, they believed, well, not all of them, about 95% of them all said that they believed that workplaces could do more to balance that out so that it isn't the responsibility of the nurse and the nurse's family and whatever support system they have built. It's not their responsibility to, to be able to endure the toxic environment. Employers can do more too. Great, thank you for that. And thank you again, John. Um, right at nine o'clock, top of the hour, uh, Mark, um thank you for turning on your video and joining us um do you want to kind of share a couple of quick next steps of what we can expect with the report sure tara the the 30 second version is this report with the slide deck that you saw was approved by the healthcare workforce committee um, last week at a special meeting um, we have the webinar today the oregon health policy board in full will have the opportunity to review the report and this slide deck and the findings and recommendations um, at its November 1st meeting. If there are any significant missings or any problematic recommendations, that will be taken into account. And then Oregon Health Authority Government Relations will be um, processing the transmittal of a final report to the legislature by the November 15th deadline. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, and thank you, uh, Jana and Joanne for being here today. We really appreciate it. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and wish everyone a great day. Um, we'll go ahead and stop the recording and it will be available on the Oregon Health Policy Board's website in the next 24 hours um, for a second helping or if you want to share this educational webinar with anyone. But we wish you well, uh, take care and have a great day, everyone. And thanks for joining us. Goodbye.